to Fresh Image. Fresh Image is a nonprofit Catholic ministry committed to providing individuals and communities with resources to facilitate the full flourishing of the image of God in each and every single human person. Not only will you find hundreds of articles, convenient audios and presentations on our beautiful faith, but also catechetical resources to be used in the classroom, at the parish, and at the kitchen table. Today, we are happy to present Fresh Image Gospel Reflections from our founder, Tony Crescio. Tony reminds us that it is when we look into the mirror of Scripture that we discover the unique image of God we have each been created to be. My dear friends in Christ, the Lord is truly risen. Alleluia. To Him be glory and power for all the ages of eternity. Alleluia, alleluia. So goes the entrance antiphon for this most august of all the celebrations in the life of the church. It is today, Easter Sunday, the day of the Lord's resurrection from the dead, that forms the very heart of the Christian faith. The first great evangelist of the church, St. Paul, could not be more clear on this point. In his first letter to the Corinthians, the great apostle says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. A few centuries later, St. Augustine of Hippo echoed him, making clear that the Son of God's incarnation was ultimately aimed at his passion, death, and resurrection. The great doctor of grace tells his parishioners that the Lord Christ, in being willing to be born and willing to die, aimed at rising again. It was precisely at that point that he defined faith for us. The Christian faith, then, is completely unintelligible apart from the bodily resurrection of the Son of God. And we can go even further here with Paul and say that if Christ did not bodily rise from the dead, it doesn't matter if we understand the Christian thing or not. For at that point, Christianity in itself is a futile way of life. Let me be perfectly clear, then. The bodily resurrection of Christ from the dead is everything. The whole of Christianity hangs upon it. This core of the gospel has been undermined in various ways throughout the centuries. In our own time and place, there are two that are especially predominant. The first was promoted by the late Episcopalian bishop, John Shelby Sponge. Sponge agreed that apart from Easter, there is no Christianity. However, he also denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus. I don't think the resurrection has anything to do with physical resuscitation, he said. I think it means the life of Jesus was raised back into the life of God, not into the life of this world, and that it was out of this that his presence, not his body, was manifested to certain witnesses. Already here we see that the late Episcopalian bishop distorts the meaning of the resurrection as though it were simply resuscitation into the life of this world. That this is clearly not the case will become clear as we move along. However, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, and there is no Christianity without Easter, what is the message of Easter, we might ask? Sponge had an answer. He said, What the resurrection says is that Jesus breaks every human limit, including the limit of death, and by walking in his path, you can catch a glimpse of that. And I think that's a pretty good message. In these words, we have a supposed Christian leader undermining the very heart of the Christian faith, reducing it to a self-help program. Sponge basically says, Look, Jesus broke through the limitations of human life, and so can you. Aside from the radical perversion of Christianity, what could be more dull? If Jesus is simply a symbol of what I can accomplish, then I clearly don't need him specifically. This logical conclusion of distortions of this stripe has been reached by many Americans today, especially young adults. A 2020 study conducted by LifeWay Research found that only 41% of adults aged 18 to 34 years old believe in the biblical accounts of Jesus' bodily resurrection. A 2022 survey of the same demographic done by Legionnaire Ministries yielded slightly better results. In this study, 58% of adults aged 18 to 34 years old responded that they believed in the bodily resurrection of Christ. However, 65% also responded that worship on one's own or at home with family was an acceptable replacement for regular church attendance. 
If it's in the church's worship that the risen Christ is encountered, why wouldn't young adults want to participate in that? Now let me be clear, the numbers aren't deductive in any sense, but what they seem to suggest to me is that while the majority of young American adults believe that Christ rose from the dead, they also don't seem to think that it has much to do with them. Why is this? The answer leads us to the second main predominant way the core gospel message of the resurrection has been undermined today. The same survey conducted by Legionnaire Ministries found that the majority of young adults, 60%, believed that Jesus' death on the cross was the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of sin, which is undoubtedly a good thing. However, the flip and downside to this is that young adults don't seem to think sin is much of an issue. 65% agreed with the statement that everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. And 67% agreed with the statement that everyone is born innocent in the eyes of God. We can set the responses to these statements in more theological terms and say that for American young adults, personal sin isn't much of an issue and original sin isn't a factor at all. At this point, the picture starts to make more sense. For American young adults, when Paul says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins, there is not much worth calling good news here. On the one hand, sin really isn't much of an issue, and on the other, I can overcome human limitations in the same way Jesus did. The message is clear. A world unconvinced of the reality of sin will have little use for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Today, by gathering across the globe to commemorate our Lord's rising from the dead, Christians proclaim that the resurrection is a big deal. It's everything. And why? Because as St. Paul says, we were once dead in our sins, but God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This death has everything to do with us because as the apostle continues in his letter to the Romans, through baptism, we have been buried with Christ, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united to him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. In sum, by celebrating Easter Sunday, Christians profess that the Son of God incarnate took upon himself the penalty for our sins, separation from God, most definitively in death, and transformed it into the gate to eternal life with God by his resurrection, a life to be experienced and lived starting here and now and consummated in eternity, as our readings for this Sunday make clear. This is the cause of our unending string of alleluias, alleluias we are meant to sing not only with our voices but with the whole of our lives. The outcome of a Christian life of alleluia is twofold. On the one hand, one becomes a sign of contradiction to the world, proclaiming very clearly that yes, we are sinners who are in desperate need of a Savior. But on the other, Christians also become the message of hope that the world so desperately needs and desires to hear, regardless of appearances. That message of hope being that God so loved the world that He has indeed sent us a Savior, His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for and redeem us of our sins and draw us, the whole of us, body and soul, back into the embrace of God through His resurrection. Our readings for this Sunday make not only this clear, but also that God appeals to the world through the body of His Son, the Church, to convince the world of these truths. Let's begin with the Gospel. There we find Mary Magdalene arriving at the tomb of Jesus. And notice John's literary artistry here. John tells us that it was early in the morning, but it was still dark. By noting the time of day, John builds in the truth proclaimed in Psalm 19, that the heavens proclaim the glory of God, day unto day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. And what are the heavens proclaiming in the gospel? That with the break of dawn, the darkness of sin and death will be dispelled by the dawning of the new life inaugurated by the resurrection of the sun, the true light of the world. Finding the tomb of Jesus empty, Mary Magdalene becomes the apostle to the apostles and runs to tell Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, that someone has taken her Lord's body and she does not know where he has been laid. Without a moment passing, Peter and the other disciple run toward the tomb 
We are told that the other disciple beats Peter to the tomb, but waits for Peter before going in. When Peter arrives, he goes in. He finds the tomb empty, as Mary Magdalene had said. Next, we are told that the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. At this point, it is worth taking note of the anonymous other disciple. For many years, the anonymous disciple who is loved by Jesus in a special way in John's Gospel was associated with the author of the Gospel, thought to have been John the Apostle. Scripture scholars now dispute whether the author of the fourth Gospel was actually the Apostle John, though many assume that if it was not John, it was a disciple of John's and a leader of the Johannine community. Whatever the case may be, keeping this disciple anonymous has a literary function. His anonymity is meant to draw the reader into the story and inviting him or her to place themselves in the shoes of this beloved disciple. When read in this way, the message is clear. We come to the tomb alongside Peter and we wait for him to go in first. Why? Peter is representative of the church, which proclaims and teaches the significance of the resurrection of Christ to the world. Thus, we too, as the other disciple, are meant to follow Peter into the tomb and thereby be moved to belief, as we are told the anonymous disciple is in today's gospel. Interestingly, the evangelist next adds that neither Peter nor the anonymous disciple quite understand what is going on. He writes, As yet, they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead, and they returned to their homes. In sum, the disciples believe that Jesus had risen from the dead, but they don't understand why. Here the Christian life as one of faith-seeking understanding is set in motion. By the time we find Peter preaching in our first reading from the Acts of the Apostles for today, it's clear that with the grace of the Holy Spirit, he has figured out the significance of all this. Importantly, Peter, the leader of the church, begins with the universal audience the message he is about to proclaim is intended for. I truly understand, he begins, that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He then goes on to tell the crowd that Jesus was put to death on a cross, but he adds, God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses. And this witness, Peter goes on, comes with a mission. The risen Jesus commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. In sum, the gospel of God's forgiveness in Jesus Christ is meant for the whole human family without exception. Now notice, who is called to proclaim it? Those who are witnesses to the resurrection. Now read this in light of what was said before about the anonymity of the beloved disciple in John's Gospel. We have been to the tomb with Peter, and thus we are called to proclaim the same message we hear him proclaiming in our first reading for today. And how are we to proclaim it? By preaching and by testifying. In other words, by both word and deed. In both word and deed, we are meant to proclaim to the world that there is great cause to sing alleluias without end this day. Alleluias which mean praise God and praise God why? Because the only begotten Son has died for our sins and risen from the dead so that we might have new life in Him. And what does that new life look like? Now recall that the bodily resurrection of Christ means that God intends to save the whole of us. Therefore, we should expect that the resurrected life we participate in through the Paschal Mystery, includes the life of the whole human person. And this is precisely what we find in our second reading for today from Paul's letter to the Colossians. Paul begins by telling us that we have already been raised with Christ, of course, through the sacrament of baptism. Accordingly, Paul exhorts us, Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In other words, Paul is telling us to seek what belongs to participatory imitation of the resurrected life of Christ. Leave behind what is of the brokenness of our fallen world, 
and live here and now with eternity in mind, with the whole of yourselves. Next, Paul gives us very specific instructions. He says, Put to death within you fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, and get rid of anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth, and stop lying. Instead, Paul says, we should seek what is above, what belongs to the life of Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, which includes being compassionate, kind, humble, meek, and patient. Paul goes on, bear with one another, and, what is key, if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. And why? Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. In living this way, we clothe ourselves in love, which Paul says binds everything together in perfect harmony, in the peace of Christ. By living in this way, we live with one foot in heaven, as it were. But precisely because we still live with one foot on earth, we make the life of God present here and now as well. And the whole broken world will witness what it desires most, the revealing of the children of God and the message that they too have been created to be sons and daughters of the Most High. My friends, on this most central of all the celebrations of the life of the church, Christ calls us to live Easter lives, to live Alleluia lives, lives that proclaim the Lord by making His life present in our broken world. Yes, to live in such a way means, as St. Paul teaches us today, to live in a way radically different from the world. Accordingly, we become signs of contradiction in the world, just as Christ did. And becoming a sign of contradiction means that the world will reckon with us, one way or another. Either we will be laughed off as delusional and blind sheep dedicated to a backwards way of thinking, we will be viciously attacked for proclaiming to the world that it is not as it should be and God calls us to a holy way of life, or by the action of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the human family, we will play a role in drawing the human family back to God. The way we do this in the first place is by bearing with one another's burdens, the burdens of the world so plagued and weighed down by its brokenness. And we bear the world's burdens by allowing God to make his appeal through us that there is no sin too great for God's loving mercy. Nothing that God will allow to separate us from him provided that we seek forgiveness. When we do, his grace will transfigure the whole of us, individually and collectively, drawing the human family closer to the life of Christ in heaven, beginning here and now, so that we might all spend eternity with him when our earthly pilgrimage has come to an end. This is the message of Easter Sunday. This is what it means to live a life of Alleluia and to shout it for the whole world to hear. Thank you for listening to this week's Gospel Reflection. For more resources, please visit us at freshimage.org. And remember, when you live a fresh life, you will be a breath of God's fresh, life-giving air to the world.